Chapter 2 of Predictably Irrational is titled The Fallacy of Supply and Demand. So what is the basic argument that he presents? The basic argument is sometimes when you increase the price of something, that also increases the quantity demanded. And of course, that goes against the law of demand, right? The law of demand says you increase price, that's going to cause a decrease in the quantity that people buy. That negative relationship is universal and it's the source of our downward sloping demand curve. Now, when we hear that, we have to ask the question, has Dan Ariely disproven the law of demand? In this video, we will be resurrecting the law of demand. Basically what I'm going to do here is first I'm going to explain his arguments and actually he gives fantastic data, this is wonderful juicy stuff that we want to be building into our models. The second thing I'm going to do is set up um, a model, the, a very simple model, and then I'm going to ask you to pause the video and based on the model I put on the whiteboard I would like you to try to resurrect the law of demand in light of the stories from Dan Ariely's chapter. And finally, I'll explain how, how we can account for those anomalies and also preserve the wisdom and the reality of the law of demand. Now, I want to say I don't fault um, Dan Ariely at all. In fact, I think the chapter is completely brilliant. I mean, the main purpose of economics is to have fun, and he does a wonderful job of that and he also presents us with some really fascinating data that we need to account for. Um, and he probably wasn't the one to title his chapters, probably some editor did that who um, wanted to be provocative. And finally he makes up for it in the sense that he titles his book a title that really captures what behavioral economics is about, which is that yes, people are irrational, we can, we can find people being irrational all the time, but it isn't just totally random the ways we're irrational. We are predictably irrational, and of course anytime it's predictable, we can actually build it into our models, which is really what behavioral economics is about. So kudos to Dan Ariely, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Alright, first let me explain the data that Ariely presents in this chapter. You may be able to actually figure some of this out without even reading the chapter or hearing the examples. Like when might an increase in the price lead to an increase in the quantity demanded? Well, that would happen whenever you, ha you don't know the quality of something and you're using price as a proxy for quality. So. That's a phenomenon. Keep it in your head um, because we're going to come back to it at the end of the video and see how do we model that particular phenomenon. But some of the concepts that Ariely presents are actually even a little bit deeper and more nuanced than that. He tells the story of the black pearl, which is a beautiful black pearl they found in the ocean somewhere and when they tried to sell it, nobody bought it. So they cut their losses for a year and the next year they raised the price like crazy, put it next to all these really fancy diamonds, and that led to people actually buying the black pearl. So that was the original example in the chapter. He also talks about this brilliant experiment which is where he or somebody brings a bottle of wine to class for people who are students who are overage and says, okay, everybody write down the last two digits of your social security number. And they do that and they say, okay, would you pay that dollar amount for this bottle of wine? And they describe the wine, of course, and students have to sort of think about it. Would they pay that amount, which is essentially a random number between zero and a hundred, would they pay that for that bottle of wine? And then after they do that, they ask, how much, what's the highest price you would be willing to pay for this bottle of wine? And they use a second price auction, which um, the optimal strategy in a second price auction is to, is to bid the amount that you actually value the bottle of wine at. And what they found was um, people with higher last two digits of their social security number, so if your last two digits are 92, your valuation on this bottle of wine is higher than someone whose last two of their social security are 12. Um, and that's, that shouldn't be the case. But this is one piece of evidence among other pieces of evidence in the chapter that people imprint on prices, that the first price you see 
valuing something is going to stick inside your head as some measure of the actual value of that product, even though it shouldn't be. Um, certainly with the social security number experiment, it shouldn't be. But there's other situations where the first time you really evaluate the value of something and the benchmark that you have to evaluate it against, that actually influences your valuation of the product. I mean, he uses the idea of imprinting where like ducks imprint on their mother because the mother is the first thing they see when they come out of the womb, so they follow their mother around. Um, but you can imprint on a person if a duck comes out and the first thing they see is not their mother but a person, the duck will follow that person around. So the idea of imprinting on prices is just, it's brilliant, I'm sure it's real, um, and it's a phenomenon that seems to be systematic enough that we need to build it into our model. So let's go to the whiteboard. All right, I'm gonna write an equation out on the board that represents a firm in a two period profit maximization problem. Here we have a situation where we have a firm optimizing profits. They're choosing the price in period one and the price in period two. In both periods, we just have revenue minus cost in period one, revenue minus cost in period two, and of course our revenue function is the price we chose in period one times the quantity sold in period one as a function of the price um, in period one. And of course this function, this function is a relationship between price and quantity, and that relationship of course is going to be negative if the law of demand holds. Um, so anytime you have a relationship between price and quantity that represents how people respond to price or quantity out there, that's going to be a demand function. And then minus, and I'm, I'm simplifying costs by having an exogenous marginal cost. How much does it cost to produce this, these black pearls? Um, times the quantity of black pearls that we we produce. And then the same thing is true in period two. The task for you is to see if you can without defining any new variables, just using the variables on this map, make one small change to this model that accounts for what happened in the situation of the black pearl. Or another way of putting that would be a situation that accounts for this imprinting idea surrounding price. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video now and try your hand at it. And usually when I do this in class, it'll be a class of 20 students, usually one student will be able to figure this out on their own. Of course, my students are super clever and they're all seniors, senior econ majors with a strong background in this stuff, but still I want to challenge you to that. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how you can do this. Um, the only thing required is to say the demand in period two depends not only on the price in period two, but also on the first price that person saw, basically their imprinted price. So the only thing I changed about the model was I said how much people buy in period two depends on the price, of course, that they face, but also the price in period one, because the price in period one is the price they imprinted on. That price is some measure of quality in their heads. But of course, holding this constant, holding um, P1 exogenous, if we were to just look at the demand function in period two, if you increase the price or decrease the price, the, the law of demand is still going to hold. So we could draw a demand function as usual. And of course, every demand curve we've ever drawn, we have the ceteris paribus assumption that we're holding everything else constant, and that includes our imprinted price. So if we hold the imprinted price constant, um, we have resurrected the law of demand. There's still going to be a negative relationship between price and quantity where if we raise the price of a good, people will buy less of it. It's just this imprinted price that's acting as a separate entity. So that's one way of handling this new data presented in chapter two. Now, it's not the only way. There's a second way we could handle this. For example, you might think, um, why do you need two periods? Could you still have a situation where increasing the price in a single period, maybe it's a product that's only sold 
um, one particular Christmas or one particular summer could increasing the price uh, increase the quantity well yeah let's let's look at a different model that captures the same concept that's only in one period this is a simple model <clears throat> um, where we are determining price and we are optimizing revenue in this case you could add costs onto this but we actually don't need to add costs so what is our revenue? Our revenue is price times quantity, as usual, as we always think of it, um, where quantity depends on price, and there's a negative relationship between price and quantity, but uh, the quantity that people buy will also depend on their perception of quality, and their perception of quality also depends on the price. So while this price-quantity relationship is negative and preserves the law of demand in this demand function, this um, avenue, the fact that the price influences the perceived quality, which influences um, the quantity that people will buy, that is the avenue through which raising prices could actually uh, raise the, the demand for a product. So we have fully resurrected the law of demand while incorporating this new fascinating data into the way we think about pricing.